As long as humans have looked up into the starry sky and wonder, many grappled with the big questions. What does it all mean? Why are we here? And how shall I live my life? For most of the world, these answers come through their religious beliefs. As of 2010, approximately 84% of the world's population purports to be affiliated with some sort of religious belief. Billions of people find comfort and meaning through the myriad of belief systems. Many of these traditions go back hundreds, if not thousands, of years. Judaism dates back to the first century BC, Hinduism preceded it by nearly a millennium, and those are just the oldest religions with large groups of modern followers. Despite the numerous cultures, traditions, and beliefs, there is one practice that is nearly universal. The adoration of relics. Relics take nearly every shape and form, but all of them give followers a tangible object to attach their metaphysical beliefs to. Like the holy grail of legends, relics have a special connection to the person or event of significance. The Catholic Church in particular has adopted the tradition of relics in order to help people feel a greater connection to their faith. Some objects like the Shroud of Turin, which claims to be the cloth Jesus' body was wrapped in after crucifixion, saw 1.5 million visitors flock to see the relic during the three months it was on display in 2015. Being the burial cloth of Christ, there's a certain morbidity to worshipping an object so associated with death. However, it pales in comparison to some of the bizarre objects that people do worship. Today we're going to dive into this subject and see what weird things people worship all around the world. Genarius I of Benevento was an Italian bishop who became a martyr in the 3rd century CE. Legend tells us that Genarius was hiding a group of Christians who were being persecuted for worshipping their religion in the still pagan Roman Empire. After being caught, he was sentenced to death. Now the legend splits in a few different ways. One version says that he was thrown to wild beasts, but they refused to attack him. Another version says that he was sent into a furnace, but escaped completely unharmed. Other versions say that these sorts of deaths would have been looked upon poorly by the populace, so they reverted to the more traditional method of beheading. No matter the exact nature of his sentencing, sources seem to agree that he was put to death in 305 CE, where at some point some of his blood was collected and preserved. Today, the blood of St. Genarius is kept in two glass ampules, and they're often seen as portents of the state of the world. You see, about three times a year, a miracle occurs. The blood that is nearly two millennia old is said to liquefy once again. Over the course of a few days, the once dried and congealed material within the ampules regains the consistency of fresh blood. This is said to symbolize a great miracle that has occurred or will occur. Since this process is mostly unexplained, it's seen as a bit of an omen. When the blood goes an extended period, period of time without liquefying, that's seen as a bad sign. This also said to liquefy in the presence of particularly holy people, usually the Pope. In 2015, he was said to have nearly instantly liquefied when Pope Francis was speaking to leaders and parishioners in Naples. This purportedly had not happened since 1848 and neglected to liquefy in front of John Paul II or Benedict XVI. Despite the Catholic Church's insistence that it is a miracle, there are those who disagree. For one, no in-depth study of the blood has ever taken place, as the Church claims that opening the ampules might taint or harm the relics. However, a study conducted on a similar relic showed that the liquefaction can occur in other circumstances, and they were even able to replicate it with the researcher's own blood. Despite these studies, no firm scientific answer has ever been established on how the liquefaction occurs and why it is irregular. This is just one of the many reasons that faithful parishioners the world over revere Genarius as sacrifice and honor this relic. The city of Drogheda is a mid-sized Irish city just north of the capital of Dublin. While known as an important port city on the mouth of the River Boyne, the city is also known for being the home of the mummified head of St. Oliver Plunkett, who is one of the patron saints of Ireland. Oliver Plunkett was one of the many victims of Oliver Cromwell's coup against the English throne and subsequent conquest of Ireland. As a devout Protestant, Cromwell despised the Catholic Church and attempted to wipe out the religion from the islands. Even after his death, the persecution of Catholics didn't stop. St. Plunkett, despite being a Catholic priest, worked desperately to bridge the gap between Protestants and Catholics even starting a Jesuit school that welcomed both, a first in Ireland. Unfortunately, that just made him a target. He was accused and convicted of promoting Catholicism, which was high treason, a capital offence. Just as most other enemies of the state, he was sentenced to one of the most brutal executions imaginable. He was hanged, drawn, and quartered on the 1st of July, 1681. However, death was not the end of St. Oliver's story. His body was to be burned, but his head was recovered from the inferno. 
going on a veritable pilgrimage across Europe that had saw its own move from Germany to Rome and eventually back to Ireland. For nearly 200 years, an order of nuns were charged with keeping the relics safe, and it purportedly lived in an ebony box on top of a grandfather clock. When he was officially ordained as a martyr for the church in 1918, plans were made for a more permanent arrangement, and two years later his head was taken to its final resting place in Drogheda. Since St. Oliver's canonization, the faithful have regularly come to see it. Today the head sits in a specially made shrine alongside some shards of bone. They even have the door of the cell that he was held in before his execution nearby. These relics are of a carb to be sure, but they are also an important reminder of the atrocities that occurred. St. Oliver is considered to be the patron saint of peace and reconciliation in Ireland. Although Ireland has had more than its fair share of troubles in the preceding centuries, this relic is a reminder to all of one man who fought for peaceful cooperation between the different factions within the country. St. Oliver's Day is celebrated on the first Sunday of July, and there's a monthly mass in the church in honor of this man and the relic. St. Oliver is hardly the only saint to be honored with a cranial relic. St. Anthony of Padua was a Portuguese priest. As the patron saint of lost articles and lost items, his name is very often invoked. However, his story goes far beyond just helping the faithful find their keys. He is considered to be one of the greatest preachers in the history of the church. His ability to give a sermon was so unmatched that many see it as a uniquely divine gift. Dying at the age of just 35, he was canonized less than a year later in 1232. For years, he was revered for his masterful sermons and was invoked time and time again for anyone who had misplaced something that they wished to recover. However, when his body was exhumed in 1263, the entire body had already deteriorated into dust. Well, at least they thought it had. Upon further inspection, parts of his jaw were intact, along with his tongue, which was said to be in such good condition that it looked as if it was still moist and part of a living body. Lovely. Seeing this, it was taken to be a miracle. The words he had spoken were so perfect, so holy, so godly, that his tongue was not allowed to return to dust. To celebrate this miracle, they made reliquaries out of gold to house the holy relics. The most famous of these is a golden bust depicting the saints. Well, it depicts some of the saints, just not his face. Where the face would be is a glass opening where his jaw is placed. Another reliquary nearby depicts a golden cathedral and houses his tongue right in the center. Unlike many other relics, St. Anthony's body was allowed to be studied in 1981 on papal authority. When the body was exhumed again, there were a number of interesting finds. Firstly, the body was hardly completely turned to dust. In contrast, many parts of the corpse were well preserved. Scientists from the University of Padua also discovered his vocal cords were still remarkably intact. For worshippers who already saw the preservation of the tongue as a miracle, this was just confirmation. The jaw and tongue are on display at the Basilica of St. Anthony in Padua, Italy, but other relics, from rib bones to bits of skin, can be seen all over the world. In Catholicism, one saint is venerated above all the others, and that's the Virgin Mary, Mother of Jesus. However, the Catholic Church does not recognize any relics from this most venerated of all saints. The reason for this is because of the Assumption. For the greatest people in the Bible, it is said that death was not their ultimate end. Instead, it is said that their body and soul were taken from earth to heaven. It has been official Catholic doctrine since 1950. With their entire body taken up into heaven, that doesn't leave anything back here on earth to be a relic. However, this hasn't stopped some relics from cropping up from time to time. Among these, one of the most controversial and most famous is Virgin Mary's breast milk. Although we are sure some charlatans will appear from time to time selling the genuine artifact, none of Mary's milk remains. At least, it doesn't in its original form. Travel to the ancient city of Bethlehem in Palestine, and reminders of the city's historic and religious past are everywhere. The Church of the Nativity is often considered to be the oldest Christian church in the world, dating back to the 3rd century CE. However, just steps away from that holy place is another that is patronized by countless visitors, the Milk Grotto Church. In this place, it is said that Mary, Joseph, and Jesus sought refuge when King Herod ordered all boys under the age of two to be killed. They shortly after fled to Egypt, but while they were in this place, she breastfed the infant Jesus. However, some of this milk spilled onto the ground, turning the red stone to a milky white. For generations after, the place was seen as a place of healing and a particular fertility. Those who were especially desperate for the Holy Mother's blessing would drink what they called milk powder, which is just the limestone from the ground in the grotto mixed into a drink. You could purchase this in the chapel for the extremely reasonable fee of $2, which probably has some record for the cheapest religious relic. Although the prospect of consuming milk that is two centuries old is not appealing to most, for some it is their salvation. However, of course, there's absolutely no scientific proof of this being helpful.
So we have saved what we see as the most bizarre of these relics for last. Circumcision, or the act of removing the foreskin from a penis, is an extremely ancient religious practice and often suggested as the most ancient medical procedure. Historian Grafton Elliot Smith suggested that the practice could be over 15,000 years old. Records suggest that the practice occurred as early as 4000 BCE, and the first confirmed record of it on a ceremonial dagger, presumably used in the procedure, dates to around 2400 BCE. A millennia of history, the knowledge that it is an ancient custom among people who practice Judaism and explicit references to Jesus' circumcision in the Bible, led a few to ask the question, what happened to Jesus' foreskin? Well, one 17th century scholar seems to have claimed that, like Jesus, the foreskin was ascended to heaven, where it was then transformed into the rings of Saturn. As you might imagine, this is not a particularly common belief. For most others, including the Catholic Church itself, the holy foreskin is, or at least was, accounted for. The relic disappeared in Roman times, but appeared again in the Middle Ages. Famously, Emperor Charlemagne gifted it to Pope Leo III as thanks for crowning him as emperor in 800 CE. Does this constitute the weirdest gift in history? Well, yeah. Yeah, it does. It was supposedly taken from Rome when the city was sacked in 1527, and then when the soldier who stole it was found in the city of Calcutta, just north of Rome, it was allowed to stay there along with a piece of the cross, where it was an extremely popular site for pilgrimages. The church even offered indulgences to pilgrims to the relic. This was the state of things for several centuries, but numerous copycats arose. It also started to be seen as a weird and culturally backwards practice. The problem was so severe that the church threatened to excommunicate anyone who claimed to have the holy foreskin or even anyone who talked about it, although Calcutta's yearly celebration of the relic was allowed to continue. Things once again settled into a routine until 1983. A few weeks before the annual celebration, an official of the church went to check on the relic, and it had disappeared. This mystery has never been solved, but it has inspired a number of rumors. Some say that angry Satanists trying to seek revenge against Christ stole it. Others believe it was secretly taken back to the Vatican. Others still suggest that a disgruntled priest stole it. The truth of the matter is unlikely to be uncovered. Despite the mysterious conclusion of its life, it spent well over a millennia as an officially recognized relic of the church. Countless people from Charmaine onward looked at a piece of flesh removed from an infant's penis as one of the most important symbols of their religion. It was literally displayed next to shards of the cross in a symbolism of Christ's birth and death. However, the holy foreskin stands along with vials of blood, mummified heads, and a plethora of other body parts preserved to remind practitioners of the sacrifices of holy men and women in the name of God. 